Good morning, church. God bless you. Psalm 111 says, Praise the Lord. I will thank the Lord with all my heart as I gather together with His loved ones. What a blessing it is. What a privilege it is to get to meet together in this beautiful building where we can collectively worship our wonderful and amazing Savior. There's a lot of places you could have been this morning, but you chose to come here. That's a blessing to me, and it's a blessing to each of us, and especially I know it honors God. It's precious to Him when we make intentional time and effort to join with fellow believers to sing praises and to hear truths from His Word. Let's pray together as we begin our service. Father, thank You for Your faithfulness. Thank You that we can always trust in You. Thank You for Your presence with us today. Thank You that You go ahead of us and You prepare a way for us. And bless us now as we turn our hearts and our attention to you. In Christ's name, amen. We've been learning about watching what it is that we say. Folks, I can tell you one thing that we can always be safe saying is talking about the wonders and the glories and the goodness of God. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Please sing with me. The hymn is number 731. morning again, church family. Blessing and a privilege for us to worship together. And certainly to have the opportunity to call upon the name of him who is powerful, 
can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or think, and to know that there is someone who cares about us on the listening end of our prayer. Certainly in a congregation this size, diversity of people that are present, certainly there are needs. We all have situations and circumstances that we face. We all have various concerns that we want to petition the Lord for. So at this time, rather than calling out the names of situations, but we just want to intentionally go before the Lord and realizing that he's good enough, able enough, loving enough to hear and to answer your prayer. Amen, church? Let us bow. So, Heavenly Father, you have been a constant for us in all situations. Times of storm, you've been a shelter. In times of uncertainty, Father, you have been our wisdom. In times of pain, hurt, and need, you have been our comfort and you have been our provision. For these things, we say thank you. And we acknowledge that we look to no other help other than you. And because you have been our help, we want to be your hands and feet to help others. Where there are needs of any kind, help us to be sensitive to those opportunities. Where opportunity and ability meet together. Help us to glorify you by fulfilling that need. Bless our families and our friends who are without us today. And particularly bless those that say when you pray, pray for me. We thank you, we love you, we appreciate you for all that you do for our lives. And for this we pray in the confidence of little children as you taught your first followers saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church family, let us stand together as we affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and that Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. standing as you are able and continue our worship with hymn number 577 God of grace and God of glory
take your scripture lesson today. Find on the inside of your program, James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Hear the word of the Lord. So the scripture says this, says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will face stricter judgment. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or, he says in verse 4, look at the ships. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs them. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts many of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, he says. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of life and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and birds, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and and Father, and with it we curse people made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes a blessing and a curse. My brothers and sisters, this ought not so to be. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening fresh water, fresh and brackish water, he asked the question. Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine, figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of God for the people of God. And so, Father, always ask that you would take this time and magnify it to thy glory, that we would have an ear to hear, hearts to receive, and a will to do what your word says. And we thank you for this today in Jesus' name. So I want us to consider today what I hope will be another timely message from our study in the book of James. I hope that your opinion is the same as mine, and certainly if it is, then I'm sure that you will agree that we have covered a very great number of needful topics. Growing to maturity, the attainment of wisdom, how to navigate trials and tribulations and temptations, hearing the word, doing the word, applying our faith rightly as we navigate through the daily trials of life, all of these things that we have dealt with. I think that we could all agree that every one of these are needful topics in their own right. I'm also willing to bet and hang my hat on the fact that there's not a single one of us that would be so bold as to suggest that these are not needful matters of concern, especially when we look in the mirror from time to time. But friend, I want to suggest to us that there is no topic that is as needful as the one that James is going to address with us today, and that is the topic of holding our tongue. The use and abuse of the tongue is at the top of James's priority list, I would surmise, really for one main reason. Because when you use or misuse your tongue, it can help you to keep a good situation good or it can make a bad situation even worse. Amen? I believe this is why James sounds the warning that he does. He wants us to realize this morning that we need to keep a tight grip. We need to keep a tight grip on the reins of our tongue. Now, maybe you're one of those persons who are here today and you don't see that as problematic. You don't see that as even being a matter that is necessary for debate. But the reality of this is, is that this subject really should be cut and dry. Because the idea is, is that we call ourselves reasonable and rational thinking people. And you would think as such 
that we would know how to manage and navigate doing something as simple as holding our tongue. But when we are truthful with ourselves, and when we understand this, oftentimes the big messes that can be made with the misuse of speech, that that's not always the reality, is it? Now, I don't plan on dealing with, this, with every jot and tittle of this chapter, but without us dealing with every aspect of this chapter, I still got a lot of ground to cover. And so the very first thing that I want us to think about as we think about this issue of holding our tongue this morning is, first of all, scrutiny. The use or misuse of your tongue will be the measure of our scrutiny. Now, notice as we begin our journey into the text that James seems to be addressing some issues with those who wanted to aspire to the ranks of Christian education. In other words, there were some people who had the, had the, that, that they saw the discipline of ministerial teaching and he saw how it carried with it a certain amount, uh, uh, amount of notoriety and esteem and so they wanted to uh, try their hand at teaching and preaching the Word of God. Because there were some folk that, even, whether it's a Sunday school teacher, whether it's a preacher, whether it's a missionary, whether it's anyone else that aspires to the realm of, 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 of teaching and preaching the Word of God, there's something tempting about that, especially if you're a person that does not mean being in the, or does not uh, particularly disdain being in the public eye. But James wanted his audience to be sure that they saw and understood that they were well aware of this whole issue. There is a particular danger, he says, that comes with teaching for at least two or three reasons. So you might teach and teach the wrong thing. Or you might say the right thing, but say it in the wrong spirit. Or you might be someone that uses teaching time as an opportunity to espouse your opinions and to say all kinds of things that has nothing to do with the Word of God rather than teaching the rock-ribbed assurances of God's Word. And so that's why James says, be not many of you masters, which is basically another word for teachers, he says, because we shall receive the greater condemnation. What James is saying, he says, it's not always good to be front and center. It's not always good to be in the public eye because the more public your position, the stricter your level of accountability is going to be when it comes to coming before the Lord someday. In other words, be very careful what you say when you speak. Be very careful what you say, how you use your words, because how you use your words is going to be the level of your scrutiny. I know you know how it is when people use their highfalutin positions to get up and promote their opinions, rather than saying what needs to be said at that moment. James says that there's going to be a mighty big price to pay if you are misusing the Word of God. But if you can't help but teach... Be a teacher like Paul and be constrained by necessity. But at the same time, be mindful that teaching brings with it a high degree of scrutiny. Especially if your confession, the words that you speak, are not always in line with your commitment, the things that you do. I mean, don't stand up and say what somebody else ought to be doing, and you're not doing it yourself. That's why I want to acknowledge, and, and I'm, I'm kind of like James in this spirit, that I am not infallible as a teacher. I appreciate any accolade or anything that y'all ever give me for, for, for how you've been blessed, but I am not infallible as a teacher. As a matter of fact, I can be wrong, and I have been wrong for time, from time to time. I acknowledge what James acknowledges at verse 2 of this passage. He says, I stumble in a lot of ways, and so do I. I stumble in a lot of ways. But friend, there's one thing that I want to say to you, and I say it with a great deal of humility before I stand to say anything from God's Word. I want to make sure that I'm thoroughly convinced of it myself. I want to make sure that I believe it. Now, maybe you're not a teacher, and somehow you think for sure that that gets you off the hook. But I want you to know this morning, friend, and I want to say very briefly that your words will also hold you to a particular level of scrutiny. In one way or another, you will be scrutinized by your words because Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37 that a man shall be justified or condemned by his words. So be careful. Be very, very careful what you say when you speak. But not only will uh, your words be the measure of your scrutiny, 
But friend, also holding your tongue will also be the measure of your maturity. Now notice what James says. He says, if any man, this is in the King James, he says, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able to bridle or control his whole body. Not perfect in the sense of perfection, as we think of perfection, but perfect in the sense of maturity. It is a sign of a mature individual when one can be measured and controlled in the way that they use their words. And to the extent that you cause someone not to offend, be, be offended or cause someone not to stumble in the way that they should go in the faith. Friend, no matter what you say, no matter how you say it, and no matter to whom you say it, it's always a matter of remembering who is in control. Are you going to let your mouth run off and just get loose with you? Or are you going to keep your tongue, your speech, into subjection? And notice how James illustrates this point when he says it, verses 3 through 5. He says, first of all, consider the great stallions. How we take a stallion and we, and, and we put a bit in their mouth. And we kind of, you, you know... For those of you who are equestrians, maybe you've ridden a horse. I never have, but I've seen, you know, just kind of pull it one way and he goes that way, pull it the other and he goes the other. James says, if you can put a bit in a horse's mouth, as majestic as this creature is, he will submit. Now, I know that this may not necessarily be natural to such a majestic creature. It's not natural to be held under the control of another. But after a spell of time and training, that horse will submit. He has been conditioned to a state, a state of meekness. But not only stallions, he says, just look out upon the high seas. Look at the great ocean-going vessels. And, and I mean, just look at them as they're going through and navigating through the winds. Winds that are blowing from every direction, just going every which way. And, and yet, in all of that adversity, in all of that circumstance, the captain of the vessel, he's not shaking. As a matter of fact, he's standing there working very happily, got his hand on the wheel, and he's navigating the winds. Because he understands that as long as he holds that wheel, that rudder that is behind that ship is going to guide that ship in the direction that it should go. Now, friend, I hope you're getting the point by now. But James is saying that if we can control something as big as a stallion, if we can control something as big as a ship, we ought to be able to control our speech. But that's not always the case, is it? If we're mature Christians, if we're the people that we say that we want to be, we need to understand that we need to show some restraint when it comes to this little purple tornado, this little pink tornado that we have in our mouth. Now, maybe we can't all re relate to what it's like to riding a horse. Maybe we can't all relate to what it's like to sailing on the high seas. But let's pull it down on a plane to something that maybe we're all familiar with. Well, yes, that's the operation of our automobile, right? Why did the manufacturer put those controls in that automobile? You got a gas pedal, you got brakes, you've got a steering column, you've got a steering wheel and all, those, all that stuff. Why did the manufacturer put all of those things in your motor vehicle? Common sense tells us for the safe operation of our motor vehicle. But you know sometimes a person will get in a car, as I've been accused to do from time to time, and they'll speed and they'll get they'll run loose and they'll get out of control. And they might even have an accident and say, oops, that car got away from me. No, it didn't. You let it get out of control. And you know sometimes people will do that very same thing with their tongue. They'll get all over the place flapping that trap and they'll say all kinds of stuff, hurt somebody, do somebody wrong, malign somebody, or say something that they know that they have no business talking about, or saying something that, that they probably know they don't have any business talking about and they know it ain't true. And then somebody will call them out on it, and then they'll say, oops, my tongue got away from me. No, it didn't. You let it run loose. If you are going to grow to maturity, you need to take that little instrument called your tongue and put that tongue under control. And so how you use your tongue will be the measure of your scrutiny. How you use your tongue will be the measure of your maturity. Friend, how you use your tongue will be the measure of your destiny. 
I find it interesting that as you go through this passage, that James uses modes of transportation to illustrate the tongue because in a lot of ways, the tongue will determine the direction that you go in life. Is it not true that the Proverbs say that there's something to the effect of life and death being where? In the power of the tongue. And so this is why we as people should be careful. We should be very careful with the ways that we use our tongues because our words will have an effect on the direction that we go in life. And interestingly, that is, has implications not only on us as individuals, but that also has implications on us in the life of a church. The direction that we go as a church can be determined by the words that we say, the things that we speak. I mean, your words literally have the power to affect the trajectory of your being. You need to therefore make sure that you are using your words rightly. You need to learn to uh, use the words and apply understanding that your words really do have great power. And with your words, you can do great things. You can either speak life upon your life or you can speak death upon your life. The choice is up to yours. And so the use of your tongue will be the measure of your destiny. But friend, how you use your tongue will also be the measure of your liability. What do you mean there, pastor? I mean your tongue has great potential to do a whole lot of damage. Damage for which you will find yourself being liable if you do not take heed to this word. In fact, James says as much when he says at the end of verse 5, he says, behold, just look at how great a matter, just a little fire, just a little fire will kindle. You know what happens when a fire goes out. You also saw what happened when a fire stays lit. He says, just look at how great a matter a little fire can kindle. All you need is just a little spark. And that spark will turn into a raging inferno that has no ability to be put out and it'll result in a great destruction. The point that I believe James is trying to make is this. He says, if you happen to be somebody who's always flapping your mouth and letting your mouth run out of control, that tongue will get away from you and it will destroy everything that is around you just by merit of your speaking words in just a few moments of time. <laughs> Think about two or three things with me. Sometimes a father and his son will go camping. They'll go out in the woods and they'll light a fire to keep warm or light a fire to have s'mores or some other thing, whatever it is. And they'll put that fire out, thinking it's put out, but the embers will rise up into the trees and settle back down on the forest floor. What happens next? It'll catch in some leaves. And here is two gentlemen who did something very unintentional, but yet they have caused a fire. But then there's someone who'll come along, they'll be driving along in their car, and he'll be smoking a cigarette thinking he's looking cool. And he didn't do something unintentional, but he did something careless. We've been riding along before. You've seen it myself, like I've seen it, seen somebody thump a cigarette butt out the window. And if it's as hot and as dry as it has been this summer and into the fall, and you, if, maybe you've seen a fire up and down the median in the highway, more than likely it's because somebody thumped carelessly. Cigarette butt, and they've caught a fire, but he's gone on down the road, not even knowing what kind of things he's done. But then there are those who are intentional with what they do. There are those who are quite purposeful. They start fires for no other reason other than malicious mischief. Some of you may remember some years ago that a young lady who worked for the forestry division in Southern California, she got upset because her boyfriend broke up with her. And she was so upset that she wanted everybody else around her to feel the fury of what she was experiencing. And she went out and started a fire that resulted in the loss of life and property. And now here is somebody who was charged with taking care of something that they claimed to love. But because they got angry, they went out and started a fire. You know, in a lot of ways, that illustrates for us the way we manage our tongue sometimes. Because sometimes people say things and they mean absolutely no harm with what they said. They said it unintentionally. 
And they did a lot of unintentional harm, but yet and still they did harm. Then there are those who say things carelessly, without even thinking about what they are saying. But yet they are gone down the road and they don't even know how they have hurt someone. But then there are those who are very intentional with what they do. They have a desire to cause harm or to spread lies or to cause rumors and all kinds of things. And James says, this is the kind of things that we as a body of believers need to be aware of. He says, this tongue of ours is like a fire. It can be destructive if it is not handled carefully. When your tongue is used the wrong way, it can destroy families. It can destroy you on your job. It can destroy you with your friendships, your relationships. And friend, it can kill a church quicker than anything I know. Amen, somebody. I mean, it can. Just like a raging fire, the tongue can burn everything it comes in contact with. But not only does the tongue burn, friend, the tongue can also bite. I mean, these tongues of ours, he says in verse 7, James gives the illustration of his knowledge of zoology. And he says, all kinds of animals have been tamed. All manner of beasts and birds and serpents and things in the sea has, has men tamed. In other words, God has given humanity a certain amount of dominion over creation. And with that dominion, we have the ability to bring those things under our control. James says that's what we need to do with our tongues. It is your responsibility to take your tongue and to put your tongue under control. You need to take responsibility for your tongue. Think about it. If you're the owner of an animal, you know, now y'all know I work for the city of Corinth. city of Corinth has ordinances to control dangerous animals. You as a neighbor don't want to be subjected to whatever kind of danger your animal can, that animal can bring on, your, on yourself, your person, or your family. It ain't your responsibility. You ain't liable for it. It's the responsibility of the owner. And much the same way, your tongue has a particular amount of danger. And it is your responsibility to control that tongue. Now, it's not that the tongue can't be tamed. People just don't want to submit their tongue. I'll tell you one thing that can control your tongue. If you let it, if you submit your tongue to it, the Holy Spirit can control your tongue. The Holy Spirit can keep you from saying things that you ought not to say or participate or engage in conversations that you ought not to engage in. You know, I heard the story about one pastor that had a big church and Somebody started something in that church. And you know what that pastor said to him? He come to him and said, did you know brother so-and-so was doing? He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You go get the person that told you. And then he told the person, you go get them. And then he said, you go get them. And do not come back to me until you get where it started. How many people do you think came back? None of them. Nobody wanted to ignite and come to find out it was a lie. And so we've got to be careful. That's why the psalmist said, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth and keep the door of my lips. And so the measure of your liability, friend, the measure of your maturity, all of these things. But a fifth and a final thing that I will say to you is that the measure of your tongue, the, 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 the measure of your tongue will also determine your spirituality. At verse 9, he points out how we use our tongues to bless God and to pray to God and to thank God and to bless him in all kinds of ways. And then in the midst of us worshiping and praising and thanking God, we turn right around and say something ugly, mean, hateful, and curse our fellow man. He says, out of the same mouth can proceed blessing and cursing. How can that be, James said? It is a contradiction in terms and a spiritual misunderstanding to think that you can get on your knees at night and to worship God and to praise God or come into God's house and to worship God and praise God and then no sooner church is over, you get out somewhere and say something about somebody y'all not be saying. Sometimes we get out of church. I know y'all don't like this. Amen. (laughs) Sometimes we get out of church and we have roast preaching. We get out of church and have roast choir director. We get out of church and have roast Sunday school teacher. 
And then not only that, we don't just do it around our dinner tables, but we save some of that stuff for the barbershop or the beauty shop. God says, I'm not pleased by that. And so do you think people are attracted to that in a church? No. And so we need to ask ourselves, when we get ready to say something, three things, and I'm going to conclude. Is it kind? Is it true? And is it necessary? Is it kind? Is it true? And is it necessary? And if it is those things, ask yourself this question. Is it the right time? And is it the right place? Friend, we need to detoxify our language. Now, don't leave here today and say, Pastor, I'm sure glad you preached that one today because they needed it. <laughs> no. It was just as much for you as it was for them. As a matter of fact, the message that does not begin with the messenger is just a bunch of hot air. We all stand in need from time to time of evaluating our speech. And so, as one preacher said, I heard him say one time, when you don't know how to end a sermon, the best thing you need to do is pray. But do not pray until you have offered somebody the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. I've already said that his Holy Spirit can help you, not only with the management of your tongue, but he can help you with the management of your whole life. Give and live your life for Jesus, because he gave and lived his life for us. If you're here today and you're looking for a church home, it's certainly our prayer that you'll continue to look, look at us as a place that you can hang your hat and know that you can be spiritually benefited and grow in your faith. Amen, church? Amen.